Welcome to Central Baptist Church of Livingston, Texas. We're glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us today. We'd invite you to visit our website, centrallivingston.com, to learn more about our mission to preach, to teach, and to live the gospel for the glory of God. Now, open your Bible or your Bible app and study God's Word with us. You can be seated this morning, and as we pray today, you can come forward and pray with me here at the front, and I'm going to read for us uh, what it says in Galatians chapter 5. Um, we're reminded when it comes to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, that God reminds us to walk in the Spirit. In fact, he says this, walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not gratify the sins of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, derisions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. And I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. And against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires." we then live by the, by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, we come to you, Lord, as people that are full of the flesh. We know that we struggle with sin. We know that we struggle with um, the things that are mentioned right here in Galatians 5. We know and understand that whether it's secret sins or whether it's sins that people can see in our everyday life, Lord, we know we struggle. But we also know that, Lord, for those of us in this room that have you, Lord Jesus, as our Savior and our Lord, the Spirit of God, you, Holy Spirit, are living inside of us. And we want to thank you this morning, God, for saving us. Thank you, Father, for saving us through your Son and leaving your Spirit. And we ask you this morning uh, to come and to fill us to enable us, Lord, to live the Christian life that you've called us to live, to live the life that you, Lord, have led us to, a new life. And you've led us away from the flesh. You've led us away from the world and how the world thinks and how the world lives and how the world speaks. And you've called us into a new life, a new place where we are led and we are filled with your Holy Spirit. And we come to you this morning, God, confessing our sins to you, repenting of our sins this morning and pledging our obedience to you today. And God, we pray, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be working in our hearts right this very moment, that you would take away the things that, Lord, are not of you, that you would flush out of our hearts and out of our lives the things that are not pleasing to you, and that you would fill us with the things that are pleasing to you, that we would produce the spiritual fruit that we see here in Galatians 5, that you would fill us so much that we would give you full and complete access right now in our hearts, that we would pledge that to you, that we would surrender that to you, that we would give ourselves to that this morning because, God, that is the pathway to a life of obedience, a life that is producing the spiritual fruit that, God, you want us to produce in a world that is falling apart, in a culture that is so far from you, God, what we would be a people that look different, sound different, that are distinct, and that, God, you would produce in us spiritual fruit. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would have the freedom in this service, in this room, right this very moment, to work in us, to move in us, that we would know we have been in the presence of a holy God, that we, you would manifest yourself this morning to us, by way of the way in which we respond, and by the way in which we live our lives, the, the way in which we stay attuned to what you say and how you want us to live, and that we would respond with obedience in our lives. 
that we would not leave here today as unchanged people, but that God, your word, would transform our hearts. It cuts into our lives as a double-edged sword. Your word tells us that. It is perfect. It is true. God, you want to do a work in us every Sunday, every day. But Lord, on this particular day, God, would you do a work in us? And we must give you full and complete access to our hearts and our minds this morning. So remove the distractions. Remove the, the difficult things we're thinking about this morning. And that you would open our ears and you would open our eyes to you and to your word. That God, we would listen to you today. And so, Lord, would you bless this time in your word for the next few minutes? Would you bless it? Would you speak into our hearts? And would we, Lord, respond with faith and obedience today? God, we love you. We thank you for the time that we have to each Sunday come together and to gather together as the church, to be together, to be encouraged, to lift each other up, to speak truth into each other's lives. God, we are here today for you and you alone. And so, God, would you pour out your work in us? Would you show us Lord, how we can live for you faithfully today. So bless this time, Lord, in your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you this morning, and I'm grateful to be with you uh, on this Sunday morning. And if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me to uh, the book of Acts. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 18 today. If you're new with us today and never been here before at Central, we want to welcome you into our service and I'm uh, Sonny Hathaway, the pastor here at Central Baptist Church. And right there in the seat backs in front of you, there's a little guest card, a little information card. We'd love for you to fill that out. Just fill that out and drop that in one of the boxes as you're leaving today. And we'd love to just follow up with you and get to know you. If you want to pray or you want someone to pray for you, if you have a decision that you want to make and God really impresses upon you in the service to make that decision, I want to encourage you, if you're not comfortable coming down here, to check that box and we'll follow up with you and talk to you about that very important decision that God might want you to make today in our service. We're in Acts chapter 18 this morning. And uh, uh, before we get into uh, that, um, let me tell you a quick story. A few years ago, I had a chance to go to Las Vegas. Anybody been to Vegas? I'm not going to see a show of hands. I'm just going <laughs> to trust you. Acts chapter 18 is where we are, right? Hey, I had a chance to go to Vegas, except I didn't go to, uh, to lose that money. You know, you don't go to, to Vegas to gain that money. That's why those casinos look so big and beautiful. Uh, I, I went there on a mission trip. I took a group from our church that I was serving at years ago. We went to Vegas on a mission trip. Say, what in the world did you go to Vegas on a mission trip for? Well, let me tell you something. We worked with a new church plant, North Las Vegas Baptist Church. North Las Vegas is actually not Las Vegas itself. It's actually its own town right north of Vegas. Um, but we worked there in that church. We did some door-to-door evangelism during the day. It was stinking hot during the day. It was a dry heat, but it was a furnace heat, like when you go to Phoenix or wherever you go. But it was hot, we did door-to-door evangelism, and then in the evenings we would go down to Las Vegas to the Strip, and we would pass out tracts, and we would try to have spiritual conversations with people right across from the Bellagio and the Paris and all of that, right there is where we were. So if you know of Vegas, you know exactly where we were. But if you also know that down there at Vegas, if you have been there and you walk across to walk up and down those streets, There are very few people handing out tracts. There are a lot of people handing out little cards that they're flipping like this. And what they're doing is they're trying to get men specifically to show up to young ladies who are on those cards to visit them for specific uh, acts, if you will. What we remind ourselves of, and when I think about Vegas, when I think about this, uh, this city, so many people go to Vegas to drink a lot of alcohol. They go for the shows. They go to lose a lot of money. Some of them gain a little bit of money. Maybe they, they, they win a little bit of money, but most people lose more than they win. They go for the fun of it all. And what was striking to me is when I was in Vegas those few years ago, and we were down there meeting people, talking to people, I met people from all over the world there. Every country, people from California that had driven over and were driving all night back to to their homes. I I met people from all over the country there. There were people from all over the world who were there. And they were all there to party. They were all there to have a good time. We typically think about places like that as outliers, like Mardi Gras, right, in New Orleans on Fat Tuesday going into Wednesday morning. I've been there too, sharing the gospel. It's a wild and crazy place. 
But we typically think about places like that as outliers, as places that seem to be too far gone. We certainly don't think about those kinds of places being God-honoring or followers of Jesus Christ hanging out all over the place, right? But the fact of the matter is, when we look at our culture, when we think about our culture, when we think about and we just take a a glimpse into where we are today, we're we're not far off from a Vegas or from a Mardi Gras at the height of Fat Tuesday down there on Bourbon Street. We're not far off. It may not be visible in front of your face, but it is there in every respect. It's everywhere. So how do you engage a city? How do you engage a town? How do you engage a county or a state or a a country? How do you engage a culture that is moved sexually immoral and prideful in their lives? How how do you go from just not just praying for people who are far from God to find Jesus Christ to actually engage them with the gospel of Jesus Christ with the power that can transform their lives? How do you speak into a culture like that? Well, I think that's what God is showing us here in Acts chapter 18 as Paul enters a city named Corinth. Look with me at the text. This is what it says. The first four verses say this. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontus, recently uh, come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was in the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. See, here's the thing about Corinth. Toward the end of Paul's second mission trip, he makes this last stop in the city of Corinth. Uh, He had left Athens, where he'd had a little bit of fruit. He enters Corinth, where he's going to have a lot of fruit, where God is really beginning to move. He leaves Athens... That is the intellectual center. That's where the, all the philosophers and the, uh, the, the smart people hung out, and they talked about philosophy all day long, as we saw a week ago. And he enters Corinth, which is the commercial center, which is the center of commerce, the center of political power. It's as though he left Washington, D.C., and he ends up in New York City. This is what he enters into, a place that was uh, 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 a, a center of commerce, it was a key and prosperous city in the city of, or in the country of Greece. It was a major port, a crossroads between the east and the west. It may have been very strategic, but it was also very pagan. Let me tell you a little bit about Corinth. Corinth was known for their sexual immorality. Corinth was a place where the main focus point of the city was the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love sat on the top of a hill some 1,900 feet above the city. It was the focal point that everywhere, whether it was east or west, coming from two uh, adjacent seas that, that met right there in Corinth, everywhere could see that particular location, the temple of Aphrodite, which led many towards this particular area. The height of Corinth and the height of the worship of of Aphrodite, there were thousands of female slave priestesses that would walk the streets as prostitutes looking for, quote, worshipers to the goddess of Aphrodite. It was the Vegas of our time, of their time. It's there that we see Paul here in Acts chapter 18 do something. He is faithful as he walks into the city and begins to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a city that is full of idolatry, as full of immorality, a city that is full of pride, and yet this is the place in which Paul is seized as strategic where he's going to plant a church, where he's going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's here that Paul, in his faithfulness, goes and does ministry. You see, in these first four verses, what we see is that Paul lived a faithful, just simply lived as a faithful Christian. Notice what we just read a moment ago. He waited for his team in in verses 1 and 2. He's waiting for Timothy, and he's waiting for Silas to join him. Remember, he's alone when he walks into into, Corinth. But he meets up with this new couple, this Jewish couple that are believers, Priscilla and Aquila. They arrive from Rome. Why do they arrive from Rome? Because all of the Jews have been kicked out of Rome. There had been riots that were taking place in Rome between those who were Jews and those who were um, uh, Christians, who were followers of Jesus, and they were rioting. They were, they were at each other's throats, so they kicked, the Romans kicked them out of Rome. 
We find Paul here waiting for his team, but we also find Paul working. He's a tent maker. Do you see that? He's bivocational, if you will. And daily he is supporting himself by way of tent making. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, when Paul writes to the church in Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonica, he talks about and mentions the fact that he says to them, remember that when I came to you and I labored and I toiled among you, I worked night and day not as to be a burden to you as Christians. I worked during the day, I worked at night to be a tent maker, to make my own living so that I could then share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he was waiting for his team, he's working as he's going along, but he's also witnessing along the way, right? You see that in verse 4. He goes into the synagogue and he's reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath. He's trying to persuade Jews and he's Greeks. He's laying out the case for who God is, that he's perfect and holy in every way, which the Jews know this. He's laying out the case that God is holy in every way in the sense that there is no sin in him and sin cannot be in his presence. He's laying out the case that, that man is sinner, that man is a sinner, that man is broken. And man cannot be in the presence of a holy God because he is broken, because you and I are broken. But he's laying out the case that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one that we have been waiting for in the synagogue. And he's laying out the case that Jesus is the promised Messiah and that we are called to make that response. That's what your call is. That's what my call is, to respond to Jesus Christ, to make him the Savior and the Lord of my life. And he's laying out this case there in verse 4 to the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And so he's simply living a a faithful Christian life. Listen, that's all God calls you and I to, is to live a faithful Christian life, to work and to witness, to work and to witness, to work and to witness. God moves, I believe, in two particular spaces in our life. He moves during two spaces in our life. He does so when we do, number one, challenging things, Like when God calls us or when I step out in faith to join up with a mission team doing something I never thought I'd ever do before, like go to Vegas. He moves when I do something like serving in a ministry that I never thought I would be serving in. When I just step out in faith and I do something that is hard, that is challenging, that when I look at it at face value, I say, there's no way I can do that. I'm not going to do that. And then I step out in faith and I end up in this ministry and I think, Wow, God's moving. He moves in those spaces. He moves when I sacrificially give to something I never thought I could afford to do, but I do it. And then God says, look, you tested me. Look how I'm providing for you, and look how your investment is now exploding, how God is using that, how I am using that to further the kingdom of God, and people are being saved. He works at times when I do challenging things, tough things, but I think he works also just in the daily rhythms of our lives. When I'm working, when I'm going to school, when I'm at HEB, when I'm at Walmart, when I'm at the gas pump, when I'm just simply doing the work that, that, that my daily routine, if you will, of my, my day, and I simply testify during the daily rhythms of my life of Jesus Christ. That's how God works. So we find Paul here the front, the front end of chapter 18. He's simply being a faithful Christian, but not only is he being a faithful Christian, but we see him then serve as a faithful minister. Look at verse 5 with me. It says, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, so now they're here. The team's back together again, right? The band's back together. It says in verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to him, or said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there, and he went to the house of a man by the name of uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. I love that. Verse 8 says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the, Christ- the Corinthians, rather, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. God was doing amazing work here. He arrives in verse 5. They're back together again, and when they arrive, in fact, when you read the book of 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Philippians, what we learn and understand is that when they arrive to Paul, they arrive with news that Thessalonica is thriving. The church in Thess is blowing up. I mean, they're faithful, they're following Jesus with their lives. In fact, we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, where Paul writes to them and commends them for that. Well, how did he find out about it? He finds out here, there in verse 5. But not only that, but they bring the gifts from Philippi. Remember there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 when the churches of Macedonia enter into the work of Paul's ministry? Well, guess what? 
Philippi's in Macedonia. And when they show up here in chapter 18, verse 5, they bring specific gifts to Paul, financial gifts to Paul, which then freed Paul to be able to do ministry full time. Remember, he's tent making in verses 1 through 4. Now he's going to do ministry full time because the churches in Macedonia have given him a gift to be able to financially support him, to provide his food, to provide his clothing, to be able to provide housing for him. Well, how do they find him? This is the most important thing right here. How do they find him at the end of verse 5? He's what? Occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. He is consumed with the idea of telling them about Jesus. Well, it's inevitable, right? Because we've seen this pattern time, pattern time and time again where Paul goes, he goes into a synagogue, and ultimately the Jews, the leadership of the Jews, reject him. And that's what happens here. They go after him. They oppose him. They revile him. They blaspheme in every respect. It didn't take long after Paul begins to talk about the fact that Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day, that the Jews rise up against him. And what does Paul do? He shifts his focus from the Jews to the what? Gentiles. He takes his focus off of the Jews, and he puts them on the Gentiles. And he says, listen, in a symbolic way, okay, I am, as he says there, it says there in verse 6, he shakes the out his garments, and he says to them, your blood be on your hands. In other words, I am free of my responsibility to deliver to you the good news of Jesus Christ. I have done so, you have rejected it. I'm shaking out my garment. Your blood is on your heads, and now it's on you. And so he leaves the Jews. He's now going to point to the Gentiles. His conscience is clear. He does everything in the power and the presence and his faithfulness to share the gospel with them. But notice the spiritual fruit, and I love this part of verses 7 and 8. Is what happens in 7 and 8. What does he do? Does he leave town? Does he abandon ship? Does he go back to Antioch? No. I love this. He walks out of the synagogue, and he goes next door to the man next door. And it's there that he, this man, opens up his household, opens up his home for more people who want to hear about Jesus. They want to hear more of what Paul has to say. And there in verse 7, as he begins to share more about what Jesus has done and who Jesus is, well... What happens? God moves. And the ruler of the synagogue, Crispus himself, gives his life to Jesus Christ in verse 8. Not only does he give his life to Jesus Christ and is baptized, but there are others who do. Leadership matters, doesn't it? And when the head of the synagogue goes public and says, I believe in Jesus and I'm going to be baptized, others are going to take up and sit up and take notice. If that guy did it, I need to pay attention maybe and consider maybe this is true and accurate. And God moved in their hearts and they gave their life to Jesus Christ and God is moving. Paul's a faithful minister. The ministry's tough. Ministry's difficult. What I want to say to us and we see here in Corinth, he faces this and experiences this head on. Ministry is tough, especially in this city. But I want you to notice something about Paul's faithfulness. You see, Paul enjoyed the fellowship of God as a faithful follower. You see it right here. You see, the pressures of ministry became a lot. I can attest to that. Been in ministry a long time, in full time ministry. I grew up in a minister's home. I can attest to the fact that ministry is hard, it's not just stressful. But in ministry, you experience spiritual warfare like you've never experienced it in your life. Just imagine doing and everything you're doing and everything you're saying and everything you're doing is experiencing spiritual headwinds 24-7 on you, on your family, on, on your church, on everything. And you have to just keep staying close to the Lord and walking with Him because God is going to move if you just keep being faithful. This is what's happening. Few converts in Athens in Paul's ministry gets to Corinth. There's stress and the strain of all that he's gone through in Macedonia. Remember, he was beaten like no other place in the city of, Phil, uh, of Philippi. Took his worst beating. Every city that he goes to, he's chased out. The Jews show up and they lie about him. They hurl ac uh, ac uh, accusations against him and he's chased from town to town, place to place. The recent conflicts here in Corinth. I love this. It's at a moment of spiritual and physical weakness or the possibility of fear, the temptation of not saying anything anymore because of all that's happening and because of all the attacks, God speaks into that space. Look at, with me at what it says there in verse 9. Verse 9 says this, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, 
but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I'm with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have, I have many in this city who are my people. Many who are my people. Critical moment, Paul's ministry. God's grace showed up. Critical moment when he is experiencing fear, experiencing temptation, God speaks. Just when Paul needed it, Jesus appeared. The Lord appears to him. We're going to see this again as God shows up again in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. He's going to show up again with his angels in Acts chapter 27 in Paul's ministry. At strategic times, God shows up. His eyes are not off of the apostle Paul, even in the midst of this very perverse community that he finds himself in, this this culture that is laced with sexuality and sexual perversion. There is Paul trying to do ministry, trying to preach among the Gentiles, and now the Jews and among the Gentiles. God shows up and gives him a word of encouragement in verse 9. Stop fearing. I'm with you. Gives him a word of assurance. Right? His presence is there. I'm protecting you. Gives him a word of reassurance. The people are here. I'm moving. God knows who's going to believe in him. God knows who's going to embrace him in the city. And even in the cesspool of Corinth, even in the midst of all of the prostitution and all of the, the, the perversion away from what God's ideal is, here is one voice preaching and speaking in this culture. People are giving their life to Jesus, embracing, but it is a very small number. God begins to move, and they begin to multiply and multiply and multiply. God was working. God was moving in human hearts. You see, it is at this very spiritual crossroads that the Apostle Paul um, is, is faithful to be a disciple maker. He sticks it out and he stays. You see there in the text, when it, in verse 11, he goes on and says this about Paul. It was after the Lord shows up in his ministry, shows up that night, it says this, and he stayed a year and six months. He stays 18 months in Corinth, longer than any other place he ever goes. He stays 18 months. What does he do during those 18 months? Well, the Jews, of course, attack him. It tells us there in verse 12 and verse 13, they attack him once again, but he sticks it out. He sticks it out. They accuse him. They falsely accuse him. They release him, right? Case dismissed in verses 14 and 15 and 16. The aftermath we see there in verse 17. And they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. They beat him too. The rulers, the Jews had taken him and taking him to the, the authorities in Corinth, Paul, the, the authorities in Corinth, and that had failed, case dismissed. So they go and they beat up Sosthenes. He was probably a follower of Jesus at this point. So they go beat him up. <laughs> this is what they did. But Paul stays the course, persevered in the midst of it. What does he do? He establishes the church. He taught them who God was and the promises of God. He taught them the scriptures, what the word of God says, the truth. He taught them what they were called to do. Their life's work was missions. Their life's work was what he was doing, and that is to make disciples, to see people saved and then help them to grow in the faith, right? We understand this to be true. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is not about just getting someone across the finish line to someone to believe in Jesus Christ and just walk through the baptism waters. I tell people this all the time. When you go through the baptism waters, it isn't the end point. It is the starting line. Because what God says is that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's not a period there. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We are called to see people saved baptized, evangelized, baptized, and then teach them the word of God so that they would, and we would grow up in the faith and then reproduce ourselves. That's what God's called us to do. And what the apostle Paul's doing here is he's faithful to persevere, stay in the city of Corinth, teach these individuals, these newfound believers, the word of God, and build and construct this church and teach them how to be a church and how to walk with the Lord in their lives. And so he's faithful. And Paul then returns, of course, to Antioch. Verse 18, we're just going to summarize what it says. And after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of, his, of the brothers, set sail for Syria with, with him, Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincrea, he had cut his hair. He uh, made the Nazarite vow right there. And then he can, comes to Ephesus. He has a brief stop there. And then he ends up back in Antioch. It says in verse 22, And when he had landed in Caesarea, he went up and he greeted the church, and then he went down to Antioch, where he all started just a few chapters before. Second mission trip, over. 
Here is Corinth. Corinth, a place of pride, a place of greed, a place filled with sexual immorality. They were a sex-saturated culture. And so are we. And what you and I need to understand this morning is that we are living in modern-day Corinth. You cannot go to the grocery store. Let's just take one aspect of our culture. You cannot go to the grocery store today. You cannot turn your television on this week. You will not be able to read your newspaper this week without hearing two words, Pride Month. Because the month of June in our country is now Pride Month. What does that mean? Well, it is a month that our country has set aside that has drastically influenced the world, where we elevate and we put our stamp of approval on the LGBTQ lifestyles. And so there is rainbow everything. If you go to Walmart, before you check out, there's a large section there for pride products. If you go to the store, every, every major company, it seems, is getting on the bandwagon. Our governments put up lights of rainbow everywhere. What is going on? The culture, culture is riddled with arrogance. It's riddled with sex. How do we get here? There's much more to talk about in that just that one sliver of our culture. How do we get here? When you replace the absolute truth that says that God defines whether you're a male or a female, when you get to a place where God defines what biblical marriage is, which is one man and one woman in a covenant relationship for life, when you move away from what sexuality and your identity is, is not defined by God, but it is defined by a social construct, which means that what society and how society sees you and treats you and how you feel about yourself defines your sexuality. You have found yourself in a place that is far, far from God. We find ourselves in today's world going down the road of a prideful and an immoral society. So how do you engage that culture? It isn't a matter of that kind of thing. As long as it stays out of your living room, I'm good. It's in your living room. It's on your phones. It's in our schools. It's in every area of our culture. Every area. There isn't one thing that isn't touched. So how are we as Christians How are we to engage a culture, not just in the area of sexuality, but how are we to engage a culture that is so corrupt and so prideful? Well, we do so as Paul did. You see, what I want to remind us of, and I believe what God's teaching us out of this whole passage, is that a broken and a perverted culture needs faithful and transformed people. You're the answer. The gospel is the answer. Um, You know, Jesus is the answer to broken and to wayward hearts. Jesus is the answer to gender confusion and and, and the, 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 the confusion that we find ourselves living in. Paul himself was faithful as a Christian, as a minister, as a follower, as a disciple maker in a culture very similar to what we find ourselves living in now. The question is how do we find ourselves being faithful? How are you to be faithful? Well, I think there's several things we can glean out of what God says to us. Number one, a world that is filled with idolatry must be met with the worship of the one true God. A world that is filled with idolatry must be met with worship of the one true God. How did Paul engage Corinth? Well, let me read you what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's listen to the words himself, Paul himself, in his own words. 1 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this, And when I came to you, brothers, I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not of plausible words of wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul testified to the risen Christ. And what you and I are to do and how we are to to, to point people in our culture, whether it's at school or at the workplace, or how do I talk to individuals and talk to uh, the culture about these kinds of things, is to point them to Jesus Christ alone. Singular worship is to point people to the hope that sets man free. We are littered in our culture today with mass shootings. Another one yesterday. We have a culture that is angry and it is politically polarized. Republicans hate Democrats. Democrats hate Republicans. There is screaming. There is anger. There is a sense in which we have lost our way in our country. We are a super saturated, sexually saturated culture. We we are a culture that has lost so much of what God wants. We see killing. We see mental illness on the rise. We see suicide rates. We see depression. We see anxiety through the roof. People need answers, and they're grasping for the answers, and they're trying to find political laws, and they're trying to find political solutions, and they're trying to do this, and they're trying to do this, to try to turn the tide, but it won't work. They're Band-Aids. And the fact of the matter is, when you and I enter this culture, we are to be the church of the living God, pointing people to the only hope that can set men free. We are spirit-filled people with a word, with a message, with a gospel that transforms human hearts, that transforms families. We live in a community that is drastically broken when it comes to the family. We look around our world today and we see the fatherless rate continuing to rise. We see drug addiction. We see families breaking apart, marriages ending left and right. We see children raising themselves. We see children who are angry, angry at life. And they don't know what to do. So some of them grab guns and they kill people. We are in a culture today that has lost its way. And yet you and what a great, what what a great time to be a Christian. Because you've got the answers. You have the answer. And I have the answer. We're to point people to the one true God. A world that is full of idolatry. That is continuing not to work. We need to, needs to be met with a worship of a one true God. In a moral culture, in a moral world that is perverted, must be met with righteous living. I want to remind us of what it says, and Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine, so shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We're called to be the light. First Peter chapter 1 tells us that we are separated, we are distinct and separate people, that we are to be different than our culture. We are to be different and distinct not just in the way that we speak, not just in the way that we say and what we say and the convictions that we believe in, but in how we live our lives. In other words, when, look, when someone from our community or someone from our culture looks at your life and spends even 15 minutes with you or 30 minutes from you, do they see what they see around everywhere else or do they see someone who is different? Do they spend 30 minutes with you and say, that person talks different, that person, that person lives different, that person has different values when they talk, that person is different and distinct. That's how we are to be, a light on a hill, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're going to meet an unrighteous, a morally corrupt world with righteousness. It ought to stand out. It ought to be brightly shining in front of people. And as a human being, I'm to live as a bright and shining person Not a perfect person, but someone who has been changed by Jesus in my life. And that's how I had to live my life. Thirdly, a prideful world must be met with humble, a humble posture. With a humble posture. I'm reminded again of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Did you pick up on what he says? He says, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with what? Lofty speech and wisdom. He didn't come there to impress people. He didn't come there to wow people. He wasn't a Pied Piper. He didn't want to be the smartest guy in the room that you had to spend time with. You had to listen to him. He came preaching Christ Jesus. He was even vulnerable vulnerable about himself. He came with fear and with weakness and with trembling. That wasn't false humility. You know, you run around somebody's 
as false humility? I don't like that. I just, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Just be real. Paul himself's not being humbly false there. He's being transparent about his own heart. In fact, we know that to be true because remember, Jesus shows up or God shows up right here in the text, right? In Acts chapter 18, at the specific moment that Paul needs him. He says, don't be fearful. Keep going. Keep going. You know, a world that is prideful must be met with a humble posture. You see, you and I are going to encounter weakness and fear, but we need to find strength in God's grace. We need to find strength in God's grace. You know, God told in the Old Testament, God told the exiles. Remember the story when God takes his people out of the southern kingdom and he puts them into Babylon. Remember the story in the Old Testament? Jeremiah 29, God shows up. And through the prophet Jeremiah speaks to these people who are now in exile in Babylon. It's a place that is not the promised land anymore. It's a place where they have to live for several years and then God's going to take them out of captivity and bring them back to the promised land. You know the story. But I'm always fascinated with what God says to them. And he says this in Jeremiah 29 verse 4. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all the exiles who I have sent into exile with from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Giant gardens and eat their produce. Plant gardens and, and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they prophesy to you in my name. I didn't send them, declares the Lord. He sends them into exile. He sends them to a place where he knows that that the culture around them is completely opposed to how he wants them to live their life. What does he say to them? Get yourself in a monastery, build walls, Don't put windows in them. Don't ever go out of your house. No, he says, live your life. And the way you live your life as God followers, you will will bless the city you're in. You will bless Babylon. You will bless the city that you're a part of. Just obey me and follow me. By the way, he's going to then say, right, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans to return you. I'm bringing you back to the promised land. While you're there, while you're there sojourning through that particular place for many decades, I want you to live your life and I want you to be witnesses for me, in a sense. And listen, when it comes to our culture in our day and age, we are not to shrink back from the culture, nor are we to conform to the culture. We are to engage the culture for the glory of God. So here's what I would say to you. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Stay in the word, stay praying, and point people to the hope that can set them free. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? I want to ask you this morning just to commit to that. Commit to that as an individual. Commit to that as a Christian. Commit to that as you are walking with the Lord in your life. We're going to have a time of response, and I want to ask our worship team to come forward, and they're going to lead us in a song. And as we have this time of response, I simply want to ask you to do just that. If you're a Christian, commit to that. Say, God, show me how I can influence my culture for you. My community here in Livingston, our state, our country, to pray for it, but to engage it. Find ways to speak truth into the lives of people that may have just been pulled away from him. I want you to ask you to just pray that right now. For those who are not believers in this room, I want to encourage you to come. That's what God's invitation is for you today. You've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning already. You've heard who God is and you've heard who we are. We're broken people. You've also heard that God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Paul said himself in Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. That's God's invitation to you today, to come and to be saved, to believe in Jesus, to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, to turn away from sin and say yes to him. And I'm going to be here at the front. If you want to come and give your life to Christ, you come and talk to me about that. 
If you want to come join our church, or if you want to be baptized, we're going to baptize next Sunday, Lord willing, again. What a great Sunday to be baptized. If you want to be baptized, you come talk to me this morning. We'll talk to you this week. Let's pray, and then we'll sing. We love you, Lord, and thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you don't leave us alone. You don't abandon us in tough times, but you are always here, always near. Your word is true today, just as it was in Corinth. And we thank you that, Lord, it never returns void. Give us courage to respond to you this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to one of our services. We would love to invite you, if you're ever in the Livingston area, to worship with us. We're located at 503 Northeast Avenue in Livingston, Texas. Here at Central Baptist, we are an intergenerational body of baptized believers with a blended style of praise who value expositional preaching, meaningful membership, consistent discipleship across all ages, and a gospel emphasis both locally and globally. If you'd like more information about Central, please visit our website at centrallivingston.com. Once again, thank you and have a blessed day.